I think we can do that. Hi, this is Michael Hartinger from Purple Amp Studios. I'm the project manager of Rehydrated. And today I have the honor to watch a speedrun of Shift, who is also present today. And who is also present is Martin Kreuch from THQ Nordic, the publisher of the game. Hello. Shift, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, guys, on behalf of the Battle for Bikini Bottom community, I'm here today with Michael Martin showing off a speed run of the new game, Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. And to everyone's surprise, um, we were able to beat it in under three minutes on the first day it came out. Uh, funny enough, um, for those of you who don't know, this game's community is very much focused on speed running. It's like a unifying cause and uh, just enjoying enjoying and re-enjoying this game that's been out for the past 17 years. So naturally, we take an interest in playing the remake this way. So what's so cool is that because we've built up this community over the past 10 years and hundreds of people are interested in playing this game, it's evolved so rapidly and, and seriously developed so much in the, over just such a short amount of time, just the week and a half, we've already discovered so much about this game. So this is just like a small taste of it, really. The fact that it can be beaten in under three minutes is quite wild. Um, if you guys have any questions or any reactions, uh, I mean, we're already well, in the, the final move you just did was, <laughs> The move yeah, you just did was the, pretty the wild, on the like jumping and... Yeah, yeah, like where you were jumping and then sending the, the rocket at the same time, the bubble rocket. That was pretty wild. Yeah, that trick was found by a player named uh, Cobra, Cobra Plays, and we refer to it as cruise bouncing or Cobra Missile, like I just did it again there. Mm -hmm. Um, typically, <laughs> you can use it by using it on the cruise bubble after you touch a trampoline. It's a pretty small frame window, but if you do it successfully, you can use the cruise bubble while you're on the trampoline. And for, for a speed run that's like under you know three minutes long, you really want to save every second you can, you know, every second that's possible to save. So you can see I'm just doing all these in a row. Um, to get a run like this where you got all of these in a row back when this run was recorded, back then, the sub 220 was very optimized. Um, it required a lot of precision to be able to do that. So now you're seeing, you know, <clears throat> we were able to complete the run in under two minutes and 20 seconds because we hit all those those cruise bounce. And uh, yeah, I've already finished the game. So <laughs> all right. well, a lot so of people have been yeah, reacting to this. A lot of YouTubers and Twitch streamers have been right. seeing this run and just like going crazy because like, how is this game beaten so quickly? It's actually because of a nifty little exploit using two controllers at the same time to select a level at once. If you do it mm -hmm. within the same frame window, um, you can actually bypass the little prompt that tells you you don't have enough spatulas. So you can kind of just go start the game and go straight to the end. And because the game automatically gifts you the cruise bubble and bubble bowl power-ups without defeating the bosses at the end, you can kind of just warp to the end and you already have them. And that kind of a thing is super, super useful in a long speed run too, because it allows us to skip one of the boss fights and just automatically get both powers at the end, regardless of which bosses we beat. So big implications mm -hmm. for the full speed run where we do have the trick band just so we can see the rest of the game. So yeah, pretty much right now we just have two types. Um, the one where you can do whatever you want that you just got, that you guys just watched. And this is the one where we have everything allowed except for that one glitch where you can skip to the end. So this is what you would, I guess we'd call a full game run, I guess. <laughs> Do you guys get to see more of the game that you guys developed? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm really curious. Do you find these glitches by chance or when the game releases and, you know, there is already a speedrunning community behind it, do you just separate? Yeah, they... You try to break the menu. You try to break the abilities. You try, you know, do you just spread all the tasks, how to break the game? The, the, glitch, the way it happened yeah. was somebody in our community found the taxi glitch. And from there, um, 
we all started getting on it and like it was, it was so crazy it was like well, how could we beat the game in under 10 minutes and then next thing you know it was five minutes and then two minutes but as we were playing it um we were all finding little tiny optimizations and things to um that make the game a little bit faster you know so mm-hmm. it was, it's very much a group effort where you know one person finds one thing and that breaks the game open then somebody else finds another thing uh one of the contributions I remember specifically making for that run was the order of the brain fuses. We found out um, my friend Jared's Giants. He was um, he was the one who was in the call for me with me for this run that I'm doing now because we were actually this this one you're watching now was actually a race between us. We were trying to see who could beat the game faster, starting at the same time, and um, he he discovered that it's possible to skip a couple of fuses in the boss fight by just outright going straight to the brain. But when he destroyed all three fuses inside the brain, the the game didn't end and we couldn't figure out why. And then I figured out, well, if we use the cruise bubble to hit those two fuses that are on the lower end of the robot and not just the brain, like we can actually skip to the brain and still finish the game. So like in, in the original game speed run, we finished the game by destroying all three of the brains fuses because the game ends when the three brain fuses are destroyed. But in this game, you guys had it so all the brain fuses, all the all the fuses, regardless of whether they're inside the brain or not, had to be destroyed to finish the game. So that was a, a bit of a different way of how the, the original was coded from the the remake. So this game just checks for more fuses, so we have to have them all destroyed. And therefore, it's funny how this game we finish on like a random fuse inside the robot's body instead of its brain. So it's like just a little example of like how um you know one person finds one thing, somebody else contributes to it. And then you just build onto it until you kind of have an idea of what um, what things are fast and what things aren't. Just you come to more of like a solution. Do you have like like with the thing with the uh, two controllers? Is this something like using multiple different? Um, you know, do you also I don't know connect a joystick or something to just see what different types of input uh, machinery will do to the game? Yeah, um, it, it, the, the thing was originally found because, you know, a lot of us are playing the game on PC. This was this done, this done run was done on the PC version of the game. So because um, I prefer using a controller, I just, oh, over a keyboard and mouse, I have my keyboard and mouse and controller plugged in. So to do the glitch, all I have to do is just select one of the levels in the game that's, uh, that's locked with the select button on the controller and the space bar at the same time. So that's how a lot of people yeah, are doing it. Is this it. something that you always, uh, when you start a game and you try to break it, is this something you always do, that you connect multiple input devices and just try to mess around? It's just automatically connected because it's on PC, right? Like, you know, the, the keyboard's always connected to the PC, and then you connect your controller to play the game. So because the game lets you freely switch back and forth between the keyboard and mouse and controller, it just kind of works. You know, it's like they're both connected at the same time. But on the Switch yeah, version you, and the uh, PC version, they're like there are two different strategies because um, on the Switch version, you only have one controller connected, right? So mm-hmm. what people are doing is they're using USB connectors to connect other devices to the, the console to do the, the glitch. Because even though it, it, you know, it just kind of works on PC because you have, two, you have the keyboard and the controller connected at the same time, on the Switch and Xbox One and so forth, people go out of their way to like, find little workarounds to connect two controllers at once. So it's interesting seeing how they do it. And in their speed runs on the console version, because the PC version has a separate leaderboard from the console version due to timing differences, they actually finish the game with one spatula instead of two because they have a, an extra glitch in their version where they can completely skip the first phase of Robo SpongeBob and go straight to the second one. So there, mm-hmm. there are little, little version differences and like different strategies people are finding depending on what game version they play. But typically the PC version is the most competitive in this game that's that's the one that most people are running at the moment including myself yeah mm-hmm. and, and but you you don't play with mouse and keyboard or do you i'm sorry what the um do you play with mouse and keyboard or only controller for your speed just controller on PC? yeah okay i would only use the the mouse and keyboard when i was doing that specific glitch but in this category that i'm running here that you're watching now, the glitch is banned, and I haven't really been playing the one where you can uh, beat the game in three minutes because it got kind of stale after a day. <laughs> you guys could probably imagine. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah we're, a lot of us have decided to just play the 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 category that doesn't have the, or the rule set rather, where this the trick is mm-hmm. banned. But both still exist. 
you can play both of them, but uh, there's like half the community is focused on that run and half the community is focused on this run. Also, you're probably yeah. seeing some really weird stuff happening right now on the screen. Um, yes. This is a glitch yeah, that's called. Actually, we, we haven't even awesome handled. Yeah, we haven't even decided on a name for this yet, but I usually just call it the flying squirrel. Some people are calling it squirrel gliding or infinite squirrel lasto, infinite sandy hover, infinite lasto hover. Uh-huh. There are a lot of names for it, but um, it's a very it just be part of the game. It looks like, fun, right? <laughs> yeah. So if if you're if you grab a ledge while holding uh, LT, you can <laughs> kind of just get stuck in an infinite loop where you're just hovering. And if you touch yeah. the ground before before ascending, you can you have control over whether you can descend or not. So what mm-hmm. we do is we we grab the ledge and activate the glitch, touch the ground once, and float over to like whatever objective we're looking for. And uh, kind of like ascend by jumping and descend by ho- by pressing the LT button again. Um, there are some limitations though. If you jump twice without hitting the ground, you just kind of ascend to the heavens and you can't come back down. So that's one of the things you have to watch out for in speed run is if you if you if you you know don't conserve your jumps, you can just start floating and you'll never come back. So a lot of times, like you'll lose your runs. You have to restart the whole game if you if you do that by accident. Um, another thing too is that you can also stack movement on it. So what you saw me do there in the rooftops is I'll I'll get the, the glitch and then I'll touch a slide so that way we have slide movement. And then with the slide movement, we'll just like fly around the level to collect objectives faster. But uh, now we're actually coming up to the Sea Needle and there actually is a little funny oversight here. Um, the way the game was coded is quite interesting, I guess I would say at least because um, you have like this weird logic here in this in the sea needle level where you have three different bungees, right? And you have to destroy yep. all the tiki's in all three sections to win. But instead of um, instead of having to destroy all three as like a checklist, the game just has for some reason a counter where every time you destroy one of these sections of tiki's, the counter just counts up by one, and when the counter hits three, it just finishes and it, and it completes itself for you so you can already tell the problem with the logic here where like you can just do the same one three times and the counter reaches three so it, it, it's funny it's, it's one of the things that you wouldn't notice if you're playing casually but just looking deeper into how the game works is it's quite hilarious how that's how it was coded yeah you know whatever works <laughs> you know you, you, yeah, exactly. you're doing the trick uh, whatever works and you know what you want to achieve and and it, it works and and yeah, I find it so funny that it also works for you guys, you know, and with without a speedrunning community this might be really you know <laughs> a disaster. Yeah, you never, right never now. find out. <laughs> you never find have out. You watched, yes, uh, have you, have you gotten the opportunity to watch the documentary yet? I think it was three. Sure. Let's let's say I quickly, quickly uh, watched it by doing something something else i didn't have the time to focus on it completely yeah but it's yeah it's quite it's quite uh, long isn't it? it's yes it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot yeah but it's a it's a it's a hell of a game trust me i know it's a hell of a game yeah. it's a hell of a community yeah. <laughs> yeah crazy uh can i ask you shift how afraid are you or is the community about patches and fixes Oh, yeah, people are worried about stuff getting patched, but I've been telling them, you guys have been pretty clear, you know, you're only going to patch things that affect the game casually, you know? They're, they're worried that um, you guys are going to, like, patch the big one where you can warp to the end um, and, like, I guess, like, the, the squirrel, the flying squirrel stuff. But I think there are some legitimate things in the game that casuals can stumble across that might be patched. Mm-hmm. And I'd under- totally understand if they were. But um, mm-hmm. for the most part, I feel like some of these things you wouldn't really come across unless you're really trying to break the game. Mm-hmm. Um, that's typically this is how something it is. that in general. This is something that in general for modern games you'd wish they have less invisible barriers and and be, you know, less restrictive just so you guys can mess around more. Yeah, I mean, that's I suppose that's part of it. The thing is with speed running is we're always going to find a way around it, right? Like there have been um, a couple of instances in this run where you can like there is an invisible barrier and you can jump under it and you can jump over it but um my concern with it was more of a casual play right 
how if you're like kind of trying to play the game casually, sometimes you'll hit an invisible wall or sometimes you get grabbed out of bounds without any particular reason. Um, some other content creators have commented on this. Um, there's a guy, uh, Moist Critical, who does like game reviews on YouTube and stuff, and he's another one who commented on the, the fact that um, there are a lot of like invisible boundaries that you kind of run into by accident while you're playing. But um, for speed running, it's not a problem because you just find a way around them, you know? But uh, casual play, when I tried to do a second playthrough, it was a little bit frustrating trying to find a way around stuff like that when I felt like, you know, in the original game, there weren't like blockades and stuff preventing you from doing that. Also, uh, this glitch here that we just did is called a sponge warp. Um, it's very interesting how it works, as far as we understand. Because um, damage boosting in this game appears to be a bit scripted, where it kind of just bungee cords you back to whichever direction you were standing in. And because the um, the slam is a bit of a translation itself, when you slam, it kind of just translates you upward. Um, we believe at this time that it's some kind of like a, a calculation error where if you slam while you're being damage boosted back, it kind of just chooses a, a coordinate to put you on, and you can kind of manipulate where the game puts you. So what we did there was um, we used the sponge warp to manipulate SpongeBob's coordinates over to the cutscene area where the, uh, the the little trampoline comes down, which, by the way, was a great addition, by the way. Because in the original game, um, if, you, if you go to that island, it doesn't bring up a trampoline for you to get back to the island. And it was always really annoying as a kid having to walk all the way back there to, to mess with stuff. So uh, that was a really good addition. But with with additions for accessibility, as you learned in the original with the cardboard boxes, um, you can exploit it if you end up teleporting over there. So you can you know, touch the, uh, the cutscene, the trampolines come up, and when you die and respawn, you can just jump on it to skip to the end of the level. So now you're seeing that we're doing the entirety of Ghoul Lagoon in the reversed order, just like we did in the original, but with a different way you know because we don't have the the same glitches and stuff in this game but we found different ways of doing similar skips it's kind of interesting when you have people who have been working on the original game for years and years you know it's like they'll find a way to to make all these skips and stuff work that they've done before fucking hate the camera in this game but as i was saying it uh, still looks it still looks as if even though you already know the glitch it's there's still a lot of you know um practice needed to to actually nail each of the uh the kind of exploits on the first yeah, time take a look at that. yeah and uh this run was completed just a couple of days ago i think and since then the game's already changed so much we're still trying to figure out rule sets we're still trying to figure out how Why to keep things fair so uh one of the debates that sprung up in the community was um where to cap the fps because a lot of people are incapable of running this game at 146 um Seems like it's the kind of game that's a lot. It's it's not really. It's like pretty intensive on people's CPUs to have it full frame rate all the time. But the problem is that um, when you when you're not running the game at full frame rate and the physics the uh, the frame rate's kind of fluctuating between two numbers, um, some of the tricks behave differently, where you know the frame rate is tied to the physics, which we did not expect from this game at all. We we thought that the um the frame rate the visual frame rate and the physics frame would be would be different and separate, but we did now that we're realizing that this is the truth um we're going back and retroactively making changes to the rule set to try and uh, make things fair for everybody because a lot of people who, who you know if they're running amd cards they can't um, undo they, they can't turn off v-sync or perhaps their pc can't get over 60 fps stably so recently we um we had to reset the leaderboards and kind of like work around this by setting a frame cap, which we probably should have done in the first place, but, but we didn't know that the frame rate affected physics to begin with. Um, so it's just like an example of like a way how we're still figuring out how the game works. We're, try we're still trying to figure out with what we've been given, you know. Um, the game is a little bit messy, but we are finding our ways to enjoy it, even though there are some things that are kind of hard to make rules around. You know, but ultimately, it's still a fun game. We're all still enjoying it even though there are a little bit of uh, nuisances that are just, you know, lingering around. We're still having a lot of fun with it. And speaking of which, this boss fight is so much more fun in this game than it was in the original. Uh, you can already tell like we're flying through this thing. And here's another, here's another thing, too, with an oversight in the code as well, where um, you have... I, I suppose it's also just a counter where Sandy has to attack you uh, two times to progress to her slam, but... 
But when she attacks you from getting close, it still counts as one of those attacks. So you can just bait her to attack you two times, and then she'll automatically slam you. She'll skip the clothesline move, and she'll skip the uh, the elbow slam move. And you'll see it happen again in the next phase, too. So, like, uh, one more time. You'll see, I'm going to run up to her, make her attack me, do that twice. And now that I've done that twice, she thinks that the phase is already over, and we can just quickly hit her. And it's so much more fast-paced and uh, entertaining. I actually look forward to fighting this boss in the remake. When the original is, like, the most boring part of the run, we always dread going there. So already you can see a lot of differences between the two games, which is nice because um, they had two very different appeals, you know? We got a reason to play both of them because we're having fun with both. How do you guys decide on which kind of rule sets? Like, is this a very democratic process, or do you have, like, you know, uh, who decides which rule sets are kind of fair and not fair? Typically in this community, what we do is we have a lot of people get together in a group, and we all discuss some. Um, make sure that as many people are there as, as, there as, as possible, but especially the, the most experienced players who are speed running and routing and hunting for the glitches and stuff, like the people who have the highest stakes in the game, make sure they're all there along with a lot of other people as well. Obviously it's the internet and you know, some people might not be aware of a conversation. So not everybody's going to be around when you have these discussions, but the idea is to have as many people there as possible. And this has been an ongoing discussion for the past like week or so. As soon as we discovered uh, that frame rate and physics are intertwined, so that it was first discovered with this glitch here, actually. It found um, the original tech was found by Jared's Giants. Um, I don't remember who found this specific application of it, but this is called a vertical bowl boost where you can kind of bowl at a very precise angle into a wall and just get like a big <laughs> boost off of it and just jump over objects like that. So this is a, a, a glitch that is actually <laughs> dependent on the game's frame rate. So uh, that's no that's another thing is like people believe that um, limiting the frame rate would in inhibit the potential of the game because some of these things wouldn't be possible. But even after yesterday, when we started enforcing a one frame rate for everybody, uh, the glitch hunters are already finding new ways around these tricks that only worked on higher frame rates. So mm -hmm. you're already seeing that the game is more accessible for everybody to play while we're still finding alternatives for these things that um, people thought weren't going to be possible if we capped the frame rate. So mm -hmm. The game's new, you know, people, so, people just have so to you never, well, you never fight over the, the rule sets or something. Because one, one thing we noticed was it's, um, uh, it's such a positive community. I mean, that was a thing for us. Uh, uh, one really nice part about the development was that, um, you know, a lot of communication and a lot of, um, you know, positive thoughts, a lot of encouragement, and especially, you know, with the tricky times towards the end of the project with the uh, coronavirus and everything yeah of um, that helped a lot so i guess that when you guys uh talk, like i imagine it to be a very uh positive uh kind of uh discussions when you guys discuss these uh rule sets yeah it's all about um we've always tried to look at things in in a realistic and positive light like even what you're mentioning about the the pandemic stuff affecting the development cycle at the end. We've all been on the same page about that. We totally get that. Like, There are some aspects of the game that feel rushed and unfinished because you guys were so pressed for time. And we still find it very impressive that you guys are able to get it out on time in the first place. But the thing is, um, most people who are playing the game aren't noticing these little these little tiny flaws in it and you know it's it's in that case like does it really matter you know if, if people aren't if it's not inhibiting the experience people are all saying the game's great and they're all having fun playing it you know the little the little tiny things that um that may be annoying after a while it's like you learn to work around them if you're playing the game multiple times over so the speed runners who are playing it over and over again have learned to work with the little small things like the cameras locking when you jump on them on the trampolines and like not being able to like interrupt your jumps on trampolines like little little small things like that like we're learning to work around it and work with it to enjoy the game and people who are playing for the first time wouldn't notice that anyway so it's this weird it's this weird dynamic that some of us were saying are like maybe the game um having to be rushed in the end was actually a good thing because it gave the speed run so much personality. It's going to live on for a long time because it has these little oversights and stuff that make it fun to play. Whereas, um, you know, even casually people are still having fun playing it too. So if everyone's having fun, isn't that the point of the game, you know? Exactly. I think so too. I think a lot of people enjoy the game a lot with what it is. And I think that the game just works, you know, it, it looks, 
charming. Amazing. It's SpongeBob. It's fantastic. It's it's SpongeBob. That's, that's what everybody it's... can agree on is that the game the game looks fantastic. Like uh, you guys yeah. got yeah, it's great just artists a, over it's there. just a very positive, fun game to play. I think that's also we had a lot of feedback from people just saying like you know in these times this is exactly the kind of game we needed to have like you know something just colorful and joyful and fun and just be yeah. a nice it's old like school the fun basically with the platforming and everything yeah. sorry people were really happy about animal crossing being released during this time too it's like the perfect game to yeah. kind of just play and take your mind off of stuff <laughs> It's funny yep. you mentioned that. Yeah, that because, game's um, also good. <laughs> speed, speed running is such a stressful thing. Like, I'll, I'll like when I'm playing this game, I'll like vent and I'll be like, "Oh, this game sucks," and like dig into it. I've always done that with all the games I've played, though. People don't seem to realize. Um, <laughs> it's very, it's a very frustrating hobby. Like, I'm sure, like after I just made that mistake, I'm like, "Oh, I hate this. Why can't you grab the ledge?" It's like you know, it's just <laughs> how we all have fun differently, I guess. You know. It's like um, <laughs> speedrunning is a very fr- fr- frustrating and stressful thing, but ultimately, at the end of the well, day, you chose it. I get off my stream, wanting to play the game again. I get off my stream thinking, you know, I had fun just playing this game today. You know, no matter how frustrating it gets, it's. And do you are you actually do you still are, are you able to just normally play a game at all anymore? Can you just start a game and just casually you know play it and just do what the developer what you think the developer actually wanted you to do? Or is it a, yeah, see, a natural like urge a by line, now right? to just break it? Yeah, it's it's a fine line, right? Where you once you know how a game works in and out, it's hard to really go back and um, look at it from that perspective. Like I've done a casual playthrough of the original game after speedrunning it for three to four years, and um, it was really hard not to just you know just cruise boost and just run around with that. You know, it was very yeah. difficult. And on the topic of cruise boosting. Um, I think it, it worked out for this game's benefit that it didn't end up being like an Easter egg or like an addition, like as people were kind of rumoring and mentioning was going was going to potentially happen. I think it actually worked out in the game's favor because the game is still very fun without it. And it, let's be let's be fair. If if cruise boosting were a thing in this game, stuff like the infinite Sandy Lasso hover just wouldn't even be useful. They wouldn't be fast because that trick would just obsolete all of it. You know, it works well in the original game because the movement design lends itself well to it, but I don't think that um, this game's movement system would really make that kind of an exploit too much fun to use. And I feel like there are so many more little aspects of this game that are unique to it compared to the original that just get highlighted so much more without it. So it's interesting how, um, like I said, it's kind of like a perfect storm where um, the game was crunched on time for development and all these little things exist in it. That we can all take advantage of and have fun with. I mean, I know, and uh, you also have like the fact that it wasn't a complete copy of the original game. It has its own personality and flair to it. But as I was saying earlier um, about the glitches and people all having fun in their own way, I'm sure you guys have been seeing on social media people making the characters huge and tiny, and <laughs> <laughs> we've all been having a lot of fun with that one. It's a feature. Yes, me too. Watching, but it, it, it's it a feature. <laughs> People, people were actually worried that it was going to get patched, but I'm like, guys, there's no, there's no way they're seeing this as an issue. This is, this is just, this is just fun. It's just all fun. Yeah. That was really good. Holy shit! <laughs> it's, it, it's really fun. So, but really, if we look at all this fun stuff that you guys find out, if this all would be put in on purpose, I think you would never get a game. <laughs> uh, well, if it would yeah. be a PR yeah, if, stuff. if everything were tested, if everything were perfect, you know exactly. Like, I thought you were yeah. like, a lot of these glitches, you know, as soon as you turn would turn them into an actual real feature, it would lose the fun anyway, because then you'd also lose the fun of finding it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as same with the, the cruise glitches, boost. Though, I think if, if we'd have put put in the cruise boost as an actual uh, uh the uh, you know, if we put that in as a as a normal just feature. It just wouldn't it would be have the taken same. time away from development too. It would have made the game less polished if you guys had spent too much time working on something like that. So, and the community yeah. can always mod stuff like that. And you know, like it's not like it's <laughs> impossible for that to happen down the road. You already have people who are modding the game right now, looking into it, trying to see what it's <laughs> capable of. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting. And you know, this is a different time. We have a PC release that is close to the console releases and. You can even mod the consoles, I guess. So it would be interesting to see. 
happens with the game. But it, it really looks promising that this game will live with the community that loves it for for the next couple of and years. I'm really hopefully. surprised too that um because like people are like hardcore passionate about the original game, myself included. We were worried about how people would receive this as a speed run because like obviously you're seeing right now like there's not much going on. You know, we're just grinding shiny objects to pay for clams and stuff. But um, yeah, of course, being of course being new, it's like it's gonna have some like issues and little speed bumps and like areas that aren't as fast as you'd expect them to be. But overall, like people are being very respectful of each other's opinions. You know, the people from the original game are not only playing this remake, taking it seriously, but they're also being respectful of people who like it more than the original, and vice versa. You know, people are just being very respectful and allowing people to have opinions. And I think that's yeah. a big reason why the community is getting along so well with both these games playable. It's really nice because this game is so accessible and it's not as like technically demanding as difficult to speed run as the, as the original game. So it's a great gateway for people who've been watching my stream and watching other people's streams and saying, I want to get into playing Battle for Bikini Bottom, but I can't do it because I don't have like an original Xbox from 2003. So they can get into this run, which is its own unique spin. And uh, down the road, if they ever want to get into the original, they can always get the equipment for it, you know. It's just a nice way for everybody who watches the game to be involved into some capacity. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I think that's the thing that there was already was a community that now can access the game whatever platform they like easily for 30 bucks. And that's, that's quite something, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been emphasizing the whole 30 bucks thing. It's really... It's a fair price. I'd say it's a fair price. That's more There's than a fair price. I mean, the, the, game is, the game is huge. Yeah. That's always what surprised me most about the game was when, when you play it again, it's just to, to remind yourself just how big it is. So many, how many levels and how many characters and how many dialogues and stuff like this. And I think that's yeah, a, like, that as a long time SpongeBob fan, that's always uh, my reason to return to it. I've actually played it now. I like in, I'm playing it in all the languages. So I'm currently not playing oh, it in yeah, German, we're messing and around I'm going to play it in yeah. Japanese. Yeah, I'm really yeah, I'm looking forward to doing playing that. it in Japanese because a lot of people find that the funniest. Yep. Even if you don't a understand it. A lot of people it. are doing that one. <laughs> a lot of people are doing the Japanese voice lines because they, they love the uh, the lap that Spongebob does. The, <laughs> that yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <it's laughs> hilarious. The German dub is really, really good, by the way. You guys said you got the original voice actors for uh, the German version of SpongeBob, the cartoon, for that one? Exactly, yes. It was in the, in the original game, the German version. Uh, so the original only had German and English, but the German version was just with uh, substitute voice actors. So it was actually yeah. not... Fr like the, the, the German SpongeBob actor has done SpongeBob since the very first season. So it's super iconic. So if you're German-speaking... Um, it's actually like, you know, it's half the experience is his voice, Mr. Krabs' voice. And um, so it was, that was for us immediately when we saw the um, the old voice cast, we said like, okay, no, well, we have to try and, and get the the real voice cast because we have it in, in all of those languages. It's English, German, Spanish, French, uh, Polish, Japanese, um, I forget the one, Italian. And it's always, you know, uh, almost all of the cast is from the original series because it just it's such a big part of how you enjoy um, Spongebob and this, every Spongebob is a little different everyone ha does the laugh a little different and um, the voice actor who does the German um, Spongebob is one of the most prolific uh, voice actors in the industry and has done a lot of you know famous roles but Spongebob is definitely his most, like, most iconic thing but, you know, one of the funny things is that he also does, um, what's the actor from, from The Rock? Uh, um, uh, Steve Buscemi. He voices Steve Buscemi. So he does Spongebob and Steve Buscemi, which gives you like a lot of weird, um, you know, overlaps in your head. <laughs> Where are you at? Okay. Yeah, what you were saying about yeah. the game being so much funnier with dialogue like that, I, I found myself in my casual playthrough um, playing this game for the first time full through. I found myself laughing so much at the dialogue with all the new expressiveness and the way the characters interact with each other now. It's so it's so much improved the way you see the characters talk and emote whenever they get angry or excited or sad. 
it just it's just such a funny experience now. The com the comedy aspect of this game is heightened so much with the the changes you guys have made. Especially um we love this moment here with with Mermaid Man kind of mouthing off in the background and Barnacle Boy is just shaking his head in disapproval. So like little stuff like that just they weren't present in the original, you know. Generally the consensus people are saying is um a lot of people prefer like the movement and the gameplay from the original, but we all agree like the visuals and the dialogue and the animations when you're talking to the characters absolutely make this remake worth the buy and worth the play. It's um it's something you gotta you gotta at least play this once, you know. It's it's an amazing way of reviewing this game. How do you guys actually decide like when you decide which game to speedrun, what's what's your you know, what, on what basis do you decide just, is it popular or is it really a game you like or is it just something that looks interesting to break? Yeah, it's, um, for me personally, I decided to run this game in the first place because I just like the game. Um, I, I rediscovered the game through watching speedrun videos of it before I was even into the whole speedrunning thing. I was just like, oh, okay, this looks like something I'd be interested in watching. And then I saw all the cool glitches they were doing and I'm like, huh. Maybe I should try some of these for myself. I'll just boot up the old PS2 and see if I can do them. And the next thing you know, I ended up playing with a timer on the screen. But um, that's how I got into speedrunning personally. And most people know me for exclusively running the original game. So um, I, th I think that, like, to speak for other people, I suppose, a lot of people get into speedrunning for the competition. They'll pick a popular game and see how far they can get and compare themselves to other players. Some people do it for nostalgia, like they'll pick a game. It's like they want to just they want an excuse to play it over and over again. So that'd be a, another reason somebody would do it. And some people just like playing the game. They want an excuse to keep playing it because they just love how it plays and how it feels. And I think that kind of chalks up to the reason why I keep playing the game. You know, I just like to, I like to see what's possible in it and improve how I play it. But speed running is like a nice measurement to kind of definitively show yourself improving and set personal goals with. Something that would otherwise be a game that we played when we were kids and just didn't look back at. And, you know, that kind of mentality of, like, there's still more to look into with a single-player SpongeBob game that came out 17 years ago is the kind of thing that revived the community, you know? Just giving a game uh, a new sense of life. And I'm, I'm excited to see how that goes with the remake, too, because people are already playing this game. They're having fun with it enough to say, hey, I'd like to try to speedrun it. So that's just, you know, people basically saying and admitting... I want to replay this game. I want to replay it so many times, in fact, that I'm just going to speed run it. So it's like it's like a, the highest yeah. praise, honestly. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> if, uh, if, if you have a game like this and people like to replay it, and there are so many opportunities and also content in the, on YouTube and Twitch where you can look up stuff, how you can experience the game again in a different way. That's, that's really, really good to look at as a developer. And just shift. I, as I understand, you don't speed run any other game, right? You are you're just nope. focusing uh, on. I just, I just speed run the original, and I got into the remake because um, yeah. I wasn't like. I, I'll be honest, this game wouldn't really be my first choice if it weren't for the fact that the community is involved with it, and that it is a remake mm -hmm. of the original game. I um, that shit. Compared to most other games I have played, the movement in this game feels kind of stiff, but it's more um, it's more carried by the fact that its glitches are so interesting and the level design is mm -hmm. fantastic. Because obviously, it's Battle for Bikini Bottom. You know, if you're playing this game in any <laughs> capacity, you're gonna have fun. So, like, t like you have like little stuff like um, the turning speed is a little bit slower than it is in the original, and you have like the jump height is just set, set to one thing, so you have less control over what you're doing. But um, that can all kind of be looked aside because the glitches and stuff like you're about to see oh here, God, how you bash the, the the rolling ball off the track and you just <laughs> land it in there. You hit that. You Whoa, hit that. Three that was an impressive move. It's really yeah. hard. Yeah, we we've ever even debated over even even using this in runs right now for the time being because of how difficult it is. But yeah, you have crazy stuff like that. It looks it's like, like a like if you. When stuff like that's like possible, a three, you know? three pointer from blind from behind or something like this. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, it's like. But I mean, what I, uh, I think on the, on the, my on first the movement choice, and the camera yeah. things. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was saying about the movement in the camera. Like, it wouldn't be my first choice for the movement and camera stuff, but um, I found myself really enjoying it in spite of that just because you have really cool stuff like that and it's also just a game that we all love and we're familiar with and plus the community's involvement with it as well um you know 
people are loving the game. They want to see both games. And it's kind of like the, the glue that holds the community together when somebody who's been so involved with the community for so long is playing both games and enjoying both. Yeah, because from the outside, it's interesting to also see what uh, what are some things that people love about the original, which are sometimes, you know, things that nowadays you wouldn't necessarily see as a positive. Because I think one of the reasons why the the, the new one, um, you know, feels maybe uh, more stiff, as I say to you, is also because it's much easier to play the new one just with the left stick. You know, with the just uh, you don't have to uh, move the camera all the time. So the camera is purposefully done in a way that that it's it's more automatic and then that it's easier to play for children and for also people who have uh, maybe trouble with the controls and stuff like this. So yeah. um, when I replayed the old one, it's 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 tough. It's a super hard platformer. Like Kelp Forest is a nightmare in the original to to finish. You have to be like pixel perfect on every leaf and stuff. Yeah, the inverted control. So it's right, fun to see have... like how what 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 different people find like uh, some see as a positive and and so on of, uh, about the old one. Yeah, everybody's got their opinions, right? The big thing people are um, a little bit weirded out by is the fact that there's no dynamic jumping, which I've never really played a platformer where you can't choose your jump height by holding down the A button for longer or less. But um, Ultimately, it's something we've come to we've come to deal with, and I think in some cases it actually does help the game. Where if you're doing a setup for a speed run trick, and you're unsure of how like high you're jumping, it can make it easier for somebody to learn the setup because they don't have to worry about how high they're jumping and, and spacing their jumps. In the original game, a lot of people had difficulty spacing their jumps because they had to. Um, you know, hold. They had to hold down the jump button to get the maximum height. But in this game, you always get the maximum height. And while it's super annoying to deal with until you're used to it, um, I've, I'm kind of coming around to it now and accepting like maybe it, since a lot of people are just working around it and figuring out how to deal with it, it's fine for players because it makes the game easier to platform with if you don't know how to hold down the button or if you're not like skillful <clears> enough, I guess, to do that. But what you were saying with the camera is also pretty interesting because most players have opted to turn off the smart camera feature and just use the manual camera. And in this, it's very different than it is in the original. It's not like a, a, an exact copy of the original where you have more control over turning the camera and it isn't as automatic. In this game, the manual camera is literally like it just stays in place and doesn't move at all unless you touch it. And people are actually loving that for speed runs because you can get the camera in the exact spot you needed to to set up a trick, and it'll just work every time if you have that exact camera angle. So the, the manual camera option is actually a blessing for this community because it makes things so consistent. Like that paired with the, the single jump height and stuff like that. For, for a game that's not focused around movement and is mostly focused around glitches, it makes setting up those glitches so much more consistent because you have features like that that were originally perceived to be as uh, stiff for the game. But now we're kind of like coming around saying, okay, these changes, like if we're trying to play it like the original game, it's going to feel stiff. It's going to feel weird. It's going to feel jarring. But if you look at it for its own game, which it is its own game, um, you, you start mm -hmm. to realize that some of these changes actually work to the game's benefit. Mm -hmm. Even though it is still kind of weird, uh, you know, like a, a platformer, doesn't have dynamic jumping. I think for speed running, um, you can definitely learn to accept these things and work around it. Yeah, you know, it works. And it's it's not easy to redo the movement, the camera, and the jump height and all the movement stuff uh, to get somewhere where you feel okay with. And you got to remember that like a lot of these a lot of these criticisms are things that people who have played the game a thousand times have, you know. These are things that people yeah. who have played the game casually would never notice or never care about. So, you know, it's if, yes. if those are the worst nitpicks people are finding, the game's probably pretty fun, you know. Yeah. No, it is. Yeah, I mean, you know from what we this run can't get record. No, go ahead, Michael. Oh, just think. So it's you know you can always you cannot please everybody, but I think we will find a really really good common ground that it. Did us to the also casual players. The common ground. People are just so satisfied with how the game plays because of all the like you're about to see here. The another another flying squirrel move here. People just love the the little nifty things you can do, whether they were intentional or not. You know, 
Like this is just what you're seeing here is just it's just fun. People are finding their own ways of having fun. That's what that's what it's all about, really. Yeah, and at least in this in this one you don't uh, miss. Like, you know, because when I watch it, I just always think like, oh, you're missing all the cutscenes, you're missing all the dialogues. But at least in here, you see all the funny paintings, so you're not missing out on all the nice content when you play it like this. <laughs> Yeah, I made sure to upload my full playthrough just so all my viewers could see everything in the game before they watch it get broken and all that stuff. It's interesting because my opinions and like my viewpoints on some stuff in this game have just been changing so rapidly because I've been playing this game so much. I mean, I think I've already played it for 170 hours since it came out. Just nonstop playing the game and constantly like questioning like other things I like about it or things I don't like about it. You know, maybe these things that are different aren't really problems with it. Maybe some of these things are, you know, it's like constantly going back and forth. But I think a lot of us are kind of realizing, you know, a lot of the things we originally had problems with are just the fact that it's not the same and nobody should have ever expected it to be the same. I, you know, it's, it's great that it's not because if it were, then people would just not play this and they just play the original. And it's nice that there are two entirely different games that still have the same, you know, fan base and appeal and community. It's like another option for everybody. That's also one thing uh, like a... With all these people. Sorry. Martin. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a one of the, it's also a testament to the quality of the original game design and, and, and all, all these things. Like, I think that both games are still a lot of fun to play. Like, we obviously played the original a lot during the development time. And it's not, you know, it's not an old title where you, where you're like, oh god, I have to play an old game, but it's really still fun. It's because it has its own kind of, uh, as you say, like different challenges, and, and and some levels are much more difficult, some are a little bit di different than in ours and stuff like this. Um, but overall, it's just a, a game that you can, I think, even as a casual player, you'd still have fun playing the original. But obviously, it's uh, with the remake, you just get a whole different visual experience you can just much enjoy the spongebob world in much more detail and you can play it on you know ps4 xbox switch on all these kind of platforms yeah i always try to emphasize um the importance of playing the original and the remake as well i always say like you should play the original first because um you know it's like you want to you want to get context for what all this is coming from and plus like Personal preference, I like the fact that the original doesn't really like kind of box you in with the invisible walls and stuff. But like, again, that's just a personal thing. Um, but then playing the remake, like you absolutely should do that too, because it's just looking at all these environments and characters and everything, just taking it all in in HD is definitely 100% worth it, especially for how reasonable the price is, you know. That's what we all love the most is that the game is so accessible it's on steam it's thirty you dollars know, it's 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 basically begging you to get into it yeah would you if if a if a publisher brings out you know two versions of his game one is actually you know the the normal version the casual version with with uh invisible walls and all this kind of stuff and they make a special version for you guys to speed run where there's less restrictions would that even be interesting or would you still say well no um, you know, we don't want a, a, a playground that was created for us. We want to we want to break open the real normal game. I 100% agree with the latter. I, I think that like my, my criticisms of the like the, the boxing the player in and, and restricting freedom is more of a casual playthrough thing. But as a speed run, like I said, like we're going to find ways to get around it anyway. And speed running part of the fun of the challenge is figuring out how to get around those invisible walls and getting around those things. Um, but as I was saying um, about like two separate versions, there have there has been talk in the community about whether you guys would end up eventually patching in like a, a timer that would allow the console players to be on the same page as the PC players. Because a big problem in speedrunning is um, when you have a game that was released on PC and console, you run into this issue where everybody's PC is different, so you're not allowed to include loading times because it's not fair, right? If somebody has like... Um, a Ryzen 7X processor and somebody's running like, you know, like an Intel i5 from like eight years ago, you're not going to have the same loading time. So somebody's at a disadvantage. So on the PC version, we don't include loading times for that reason. 
But on console, everybody's loading times are the same, so we include them. So the problem that happens here is that, like, especially on console, because the Switch version has really slow loading times, as people have commented on, and then the faster consoles like PS4 Pro load the game faster. It's like people are at, at a disadvantage because they can't play the game on equal footing based on the console they have. So that's like when you say um, a separate version for speedrunning, um, ideally we would probably want it to be the same as the casual experience, regardless of whether it has invisible walls or not. But um, we, def- we definitely we would look forward to something like a speedrun timer or just like an in-game timer. A lot of games have Im- implemented that recently, like um, A Hat in Time, which is on Unreal Engine 3. Um, there's Celeste. I don't know what that was built on, but um, a lot of games are kind of taking the approach where they're adding an in-game timer to keep the game accessible for people because we're already seeing, like, there are some people who have a lot of trouble running this game, and that's the reason why we in- instituted the, fi- the 60 FPS cap because we want to keep it accessible and fair for everybody. You don't, you don't want to make somebody buy an ex- extremely expensive graphics card to speed run a game, you know? But um, people who are stuck on the Switch version are demotivated from playing because they can't compete with the loading times. But if you had a timer that pauses automatically in the game whenever you enter a new level and then unpauses whenever the level loads, that would really be helpful for those guys who can't afford to, you know, get like an Xbox One X or something like a $500, $600 console to play the game. You know, a lot of games are doing it for that reason. Yep. Mm. How do you come up with the, the order of, saying, of levels? How, how do you come up with the order of levels you, you, you're approaching? So is this just the, the optimal way to <clears throat> beat it in one hour or... So yeah, this must think, be as hundreds of, right now, of tries. Um, we uh, we believe this was the fastest at the time, but obviously since the game's so new and every day it's changing, um, now we've moved stuff around and found new ways of getting new spatulas. Typically, what happens is you'll order things based on um, spatula count. Foremost is um, if you don't have enough spatulas to get into a level, you have to do it later when you have enough. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the rounding decisions that are going in right now, because obviously the game is pretty new and it's not like as complex where there are things that have to go in certain spots for certain reasons. Um, one of the biggest routing decisions that we made is this glitch called collectible counter abuse. It actually was in the original game, but in this game it exists because of an oversight where um, apparently the game doesn't clear memory between levels. So if you go to a level that has six objects collected, like say you have six wheels collected in downtown Bikini Bottom, and you warp from downtown Bikini Bottom to the Kelp Forest, those six wheels stay in the game's memory as the primary collectible being collected six times. So it just automatically finishes the challenge for you. And I ran into this in casual play by accident, and I was really confused by it. But it just it just finished the challenge for me without doing anything. So throughout the run, we just all we do is we collect six wheels to set it up. Right to set up the glitch, you set up six. You get you collect six wheels, and then you go to whatever level it is, like say it's Goo Lagoon with, you know, saving the kids in Goo Lagoon, Kelp Forest with finding the lost campers, um, Rock Bottom with finding the lost um, the lost artwork. As long as you warp from downtown to that level, you just automatically finish the challenge and it gives you the spatula for it. So the reason why um, we do some of the routing is like if we have to go back to downtown to get something, we'll make sure we put it between two levels so when we warp to downtown, we can warp over to rock bottom immediately after that and collect and get our painting reward for that. Uh, there's another thing too is um, there's another funny oversight you guys have probably seen on social media where you can somehow get Patrick and Sandy into SpongeBob's pineapple because the game doesn't check to see which character you are when you warp to it. So that's another thing too is we'll we'll do SpongeBob's dream and we'll, we'll finish Sandy's dream as Sandy. And then immediately after, we'll warp over to Jellyfish Fields because Jellyfish Fields, Patrick's Dilemma, does not check to see if you're Sandy or not. So you can just warp into Jellyfish Fields with Sandy and use her gliding ability to just glide across the whole level with the flying squirrel exploit. So there are some little things like that where we'll order it in certain ways. So we, we make sure that we're Sandy when we enter this level. We'll make sure that we have downtown as the previous level loaded so we can get stuff for free. It even works with the cannons in Dutchman's Graveyard. If you just switch to downtown and switch back to the graveyard, the game's like, oh, you hit all the cannons, just as a little oversight. But stuff like that is like, I'd normally be like, oh, man, this actually hurts casual play a lot. It makes the game 
you know, less fun and whatever. But I haven't seen anybody notice that yet. It's just the speedrunners who are noticing that, even though it seems like it would be obvious because we're so, like, experienced with glitch hunting. Like, it's something that nobody who's playing casually has noticed, except for, like, maybe some of us who are looking for stuff like that. And it's also I just... I saw a couple of... So uh, a couple of guys, people noticed this, but that's really not a deal breaker. You know, it's actually fun. It's it's silly. It's stupid. It's you know, it's it, it maybe breaks the, the 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 flow of the game, whatever it is. But you know, <laughs> all the comments yeah, I see is, yeah, I, I can make another playthrough now because the the game is done in ten hours. Yeah, but like you never know. In average, you, you know, you can finish the game in ten hours if you are. Uh, a casual player and and people just say cool so i can just try to use this to my advantage for my next run or whatever it is and i have free save slots anyway so it's it's actually i think the general <laughs> consensus with this game is that um it's it's got like it's got some flaws but it's fun so mm-hmm. and i think with with them um, trying I to appeal to a speed running community you guys kind of hit a nail on the head with like it is it is a little bit like some of the areas are unchecked and some things aren't tested but that's kind of what, that makes it fun for us <laughs> the people who are playing it casually can like they can run across these little things like the characters inflating and stuff and they can have a good laugh and it's just a good time mm-hmm. well i wouldn't say it's untested i think we that, that would hurt a little but no, it is no. uh i think you can never find everything on a complex game like this, but it's also, as you say, like, you know, most casual players, the reason I think why people just don't find these things is because, you know, the game is fun and you listen to the characters and you you talk to characters, you want to play the game in kind of the normal order that it's presented to you, because uh, I think compared to normal platformers, you just have a lot of uh, dialogue and a lot of story, which in, in most 3D platformers, you, you don't really have that as much. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's also from the TV series that you likely love very much, because who wouldn't? And and then you just, you know, it's, I think you just fall into the experience itself and then it's it's natural to follow it in the way that it's presented. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I've been looking around Twitch and YouTube and everybody's been enjoying the game. So all I ever wanted out of this game is for people to enjoy it. You know, for me, for me, this game is more of a community experience where its existence is honestly a miracle for us. We never expected this to ever happen. And uh, now that it's here, you know, all we've ever cared about is just people who are who've never played before, who just want to play for the first time, getting into it and enjoying it. And I can say that I'm 100 percent satisfied with that outcome. No, that's good to hear. Yeah, definitely. If people should have a good time with the games, they they buy and play, and definitely we have read it. Speed for those. It has been a lot of fun, like poking fun at the little decisions that have been made here and there, with like the C needle counter, where it doesn't actually check to see if you've done everything and stuff like that. It's been a, it's been a good laugh for all of us. We know we know you guys are crunched for time, so it's all it's all on a matter of context. We all appreciate what you guys have done. Yeah, that's good. That's good, you know. It's very, um, it's, it's funny in a it's 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 a funny game, you know. It's funny in multiple ways. I, I was saying on Twitter, um, it's comedy gold, you know. Like you run you run across a little like a little glitch that just like it's just it's just funny how it even works. Like I was on I was on Sand Mountain just like hitting robots. I, I jumped on the robot's head by accident and it just bounced me like 20 feet in the air and I just died. And I was in the middle of a speed run and I lost a lot of time on it, but I was still like, it was still funny, you know? I was still laughing at it. It was a good time. Yeah, that's good. That's really good to hear. And we also get this feedback from a lot of people that, that they just enjoy it and uh, every glitch they find or issue, they, they actually laugh about it. And... They love it actually. So, but what's that? That's as a general consensus <laughs> is that like there are like little annoyances there and here and there, but they're ultimately just funny. You know, there's something that we can all just kind of like laugh at and have fun with. It's, and um, works. It works. it's a unique experience. It's fun. <laughs> it's a unique experience. That's true. And it came out on four platforms at the same day. That that's one, yeah. quite something, you know. Yeah, you did. Really You're sense. right. Yeah, that is true. Um. Did you play it on consoles too? Or you? Hmm? Hmm? I was you saying, uh, have you ever tried to? Or like 
leaking the game too early and that I'm, I was kind of worried that it was going to affect the launch because people were leaking it before um, the patch came out and that was kind of like mm -hmm. some of us were worried that people were getting a negative impression people were like complaining about stuff but I think a lot of those people who were saying those mean things before the game even came out they probably weren't playing on they, they probably weren't even playing on playing in the first place because as soon as people who wanted to play got their hands on the game they all had fun with it so those worries yeah, kind of just melted away seen, yeah we've also seen like that you know so far we're, we're just riding a wave of of, of positivity and, and and awesome feedback and just people enjoying this game and lots and lots and lots of people enjoying this game so um i mean at some point you need to force yourself to stop you know reading youtube comments and all of this because you also got to work but it's still you know it's always yeah, nice to just see how people too long. art is yeah you can't stop yeah. you know metacritic comments by the fans and stuff like this where just so many yeah some of, uh, some of these reviews are not really fair in their analysis either like some people are just giving the game bad scores because they couldn't beat a certain level it's um stuff like that you uh, just you always really have those and you know, like I could sit here and like obviously I know everything about the original. I can sit here and nitpick the game to every little detail, but like, do I really need to do that? You know, I think most people are on the same page for that. Where it's like it's a different game; it shouldn't be um, treated as the same thing. Oh, that was a cool move. People shouldn't have expected that. Yeah. I am not yeah, these vertical but ball boosts are, are really fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> I met Ludwig. This, this is something, but because you said it before, you are really happy that this is a different game. I don't think it's a different game, but it plays differently, like the original. Definitely, it doesn't. Yeah, I agree. Not, not a global, to, but to the blind eye, people would think it's a repaint with um, new yeah, graphics and better animations for like, dialogue and stuff. But um, to us, the way because we know everything about it, it just feels so much different. And because you know. It, it's the it's the same game to people who played it when they were kids, and it's a different game to people who are hardcore fans. It kind of just worked out perfectly, really. You know, it's, I mean, seeing how popular the game has become with not just casual play but also speed running in such a short amount of time, it's really um, it kind of just drives it home that you know we we got exactly what we wanted. The more we the more we think about it, the more we analyze it and like sort out our feelings and stuff because. When you're so attached to a game that you've been playing for so long, it's hard to take yourself out of it and kind of put yourself in a position to like accept something that's new and different. But the more you warm up to it, the more you realize, you know, it's a it's a positive, it's a very positive thing. You know, you're about to see like in the final fight here, um, the strategies in this level are so different than the original, where there's a debug trigger you can just touch and end the fight instantly. In this fight, we actually have a little trick called plankton disable where I kind of set this up and hit him at just the right time so when I hit him, he can no longer hit me. And then we just do this little pattern where we just skillfully hit these buttons on the, on the head in a certain order, you know, based on when he goes to sleep and whatnot, to do it as quickly as possible. Now I can understand that you needed hundreds and hundreds of hours to find all these things. You have to try out all the order of the and buttons hundreds, and stuff hundreds like of people. this. So this would never have been possible without all the people who'd find these things. It's all like yeah. different yeah. people contributing and collaborating and talking about this stuff to make to figure out what the fastest way is. And it's fun. It's like you're kind of making your own patches when you, you find a new trick and it's like, oh, this spatula is suddenly fast. And then we start doing that spatula, you know. It's like it keeps the game alive. Even like um, the original game from 2003, whenever you find a new yeah. little trick and a new little way to get a spatula, it's like the game entirely changes and it just keeps it fresh and fun. How long has it been since there has been a new glitch found for the original? No um, the, the latest major thing, well, because there are glitches found all the time, but not all of them are useful because the game is so optimized and so figured out that, like, you'll find something that's brand new and crazy, but it just doesn't save time because the fastest stuff is already found for a lot of things. But um, the most recent really fast thing that we found um, is a tech called vertical momentum storage. And you can you can activate that by pretty much like storing um, upward momentum from like floating tiki's and like warping through levels. You can do it by like bouncing off, like rolling off of balls and jumping off of them. 
Um, but again, like that, even that thing is like very limited in its applications because it's just um, it doesn't save enough time to be super significant, at least as of right now. So like, yeah, the original game is still not a solved game. We're still finding stuff, and it's still an adventure just like this one is. So it's fun to see both games evolve alongside each other. Both games are very active. People are playing both quite a bit. But the key here is that we're we're all allowed to enjoy what we want to enjoy. We're all respectful of one another, and we're all just having fun playing the games. And that's pretty much what it's all about in the end. Yes, well, that's that's a really nice sentence for the end because I think now we only have one more minute to go. But yeah, excellent run. What, what Thank do you thanks, expect? For, thanks for all your like a represent as a representative of the whole speedrunning community i think we want to thank you for all your input all your energy during the development yeah I mean, guys you were already, i've always tried to visit the guys. guys it's um it's important for people to know that you guys have always been on our side you've always been in touch you've always been watching um obviously everybody's got their own opinions on the good the bad the best the better you know all that kind of stuff but in the end we all had fun playing it, and we're still gonna have fun playing it for years to come. And that's, that's what so matters good. in the end is that, you know, we, replayability, we're all having fun with it. Awesome, really, really good to have you. Thank you.